Torah TV. The world is thinking. Jonah is a contributing editor at Wired and the author of How We Decide, and Proust was a neuroscientist. He graduated from Columbia University and studied at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He's written for The New Yorker, Nature, Seed, The Washington Post, and The Boston Globe. He's also a contributing editor at Scientific American Mind and National Public Radio's Radio Lab. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Jonah Lira. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, it, it really is a, uh, a, a special pleasure to be in this beautiful new space. Can everyone hear me? No? I'm, I'm Stay here? Is, is that better? OK. I guess I'm bound. Um, well, it, it really is a pleasure to be here. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, I, I thought I'd begin by telling you how I came to write a book on decision making. Um, you know, it's kind of a lofty decision, which, which subject you're going to write about for a book. Uh, and, and the actual moment that led me to write this book uh, is slightly embarrassing. Um, my wife and I were in the supermarket, and we'd gotten together all our things, and we were at the checkout line putting them on the conveyor belt, when all of a sudden we remember that we'd forgotten to buy cereal. So I'm sent back to the cereal aisle with relatively straightforward instructions just to buy a box of Cheerios. And so I run back to the cereal aisle and see the big yellow box of Cheerios and reach for the Cheerios, only to see right next to that a box of Honey Nut Cheerios. And I think to myself, you know, Honey Nut Cheerios are much more delicious than regular Cheerios. That's what I should buy. So I reach for the Honey Nut Cheerios, only to see right next to that a box of multigrain Cheerios. Then I think, well, I should get some fiber in my diet. I should buy those. And I see a box of gen generic Cheerios, which are 99 cents cheaper. So I reach for that, and I'll, I'll spare you my entire interior monologue because it doesn't get more interesting. But, but 10 minutes go by, and I spot my wife at the corner of my looking at me like I've lost my mind because I can't pick a box of cereal. Um, and it was that everyday failure that I think first inspired me to write a book on decision making. Um, and of course, it wasn't just Cheerios and cereal. It was floss. It was toothpaste. The toothpaste aisle was a particular nemesis. Um, <laughs> And it was, it, was, it was that everyday failure which, which led me to write this book. Um, I, I became very interested in, number one, what was happening inside my head as I struggled and too often failed to make a decision. And number two, and more importantly, what should have been happening inside my head. And one of the first things I discovered is that for a long, long time, almost since the beginning, uh, since, since we first started thinking about these kinds of questions, the, the question of decision making, it seemed pretty straightforward that the best way to make decisions, and this goes all the way back to the Bible and certainly played on the ancient Greeks, the best way to make decisions was to be as rational as possible, was to have deliberate reason, to make long lists of pros and cons, to analyze things carefully and deliberately. This gift of reason, this Promethean gift of reason, was what set us apart from everything else, from the dominion of all the other animals. It's why we were created on the very last day, because we were possessed with reason. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I, mean, you know, I think one of my favorite examples of, of just how influential this idea was is if you read Plato, he's got this great metaphor of the mind, which is he compares the mind to a charioteer. And so he says there's this rational rider, and his job is to keep a tight rein on the emotional horses, these impulsive, impetuous beasts which lead us astray, which lead us to take out subprime mortgages and put too much you know, debt in our credit cards. And, and the best decision makers. Plato said, were the ones who, who kept the tightest reins on these horses, who had the most control, who exercised the most reason. They were the ones who should be philosopher kings. This, this very simple idea that reason is good and emotions lead us astray became incredibly influential over the course of the next, thousand, next couple thousand years. It went on, of course, to become the founding assumption of modern economics. Uh, and the idea was that you, know, you could create all sorts of elegant models about how people behave in economies if you just had one assumption, which is that people are rational agents, that we act like homo economicus, those people in economics textbooks. And, and this, this, this really is a lovely idea. It does allow you to build these models. It, it does allow you to make all sorts of assumptions about human nature. It does elevate us above 
chimps and our pets. There's just one problem with the assumption of rationality, with seeing us as uber-rational agents, which is that it's just not true. Um, and it, I think one of the first convincing pieces of evidence that we're not nearly as rational as we think we are comes from the work of Antonio Damasio, a neurologist now at USC, who in 1982 began studying a patient named Elliot. Elliot had a brain tumor in his frontal lobes and a part of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex. And after a surgery, Elliot, by the way, was a very successful fellow. He was an executive in a Fortune 500 company, an accounting executive, scored in the 97th percentile on intelligence tests, so, so a very smart guy. And at first, the surgery to remove this tumor seemed like a great success. You know, he didn't lose language, he had no aphasias, you know, his intelligence remained the same. But then over time, it became apparent that, that Elliot did suffer one terrible symptom, one terrible side effect from the surgery, that Elliot lost the ability to experience emotions. So all those everyday feelings of pleasure and anxiety and excitement and nervousness that we all take for granted, Elliot didn't experience. Now, you'd think if, if you were Plato um, or, or a modern economist that this would lead Elliot to become the best decision maker possible, right? He'd, he, he'd be a philosopher king. He wouldn't be led astray by these silly horses telling us to do the wrong thing. But that's not at all what happened to Elliot. Instead, what Demacia found was that Elliot became pathologically indecisive. It was like me in the cereal aisle, only much, much worse. Demacia describes, you know, giving Elliot a patient consent form and watching as it took him 30 minutes to choose between a blue pen or a black pen. He describes how it would take him all day to try to figure out where to eat lunch. And then once he finally decided where to go, assuming the restaurant was still open, it would take him another few hours to choose which sandwich to order. So, so all these everyday decisions became all but impossible for Elliot. He could never make up his mind. And this, this was one of the first insights that, that, that our emotions weren't just these negative things that lead us astray, but our emotions actually underlied so much of everyday behavior. So much of all our decisions were actually driven by this subterranean world of feelings and emotions and passions and instincts and intuitions that, that even when we weren't aware that we were feeling something, even when we weren't conscious of these emotions, they were still driving our behavior. And of course, this isn't just trite, banal decisions like which sandwich to order. I think this also is true of our weightiest decisions. Um, you know, to use that old tired cliche that what we're consciously aware of, the reasons we're consciously aware of in terms of trying to figure out our decisions, that really is just the, the, the smallest tip of the iceberg in terms of what the mind is up to. And, and, and so now I'd like to do a little audience participation just, just to demonstrate this. And, and I, one of my favorite examples of how our feelings, these feelings we're not aware of at all, drive so many of our decisions, uh, is the trolley scenario. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, so, so the first scenario is you're driving a runaway trolley. This, this, this is a hypothetical which has been used by philosophers for a couple decades. You're driving a runaway trolley, and on the track ahead of you, if you do nothing, you see five workers, and you're going to run them all over. They're all going to die. So if you do nothing, this runaway trolley is going to kill five workers. However, you can also turn the wheel just a little bit to the right onto another track, in which case you'll only kill one worker. So wh who would turn the wheel? Raise your hand if you would turn the wheel to, to avert it onto the second track and only kill one worker. Congratulations, you're a representative sample. So you can ask this question all over the world, and 95 to 97% of people say, of course I'd turn the wheel. That's simple arithmetic. Better to kill one per I mean, it's terrible for the one guy who's now going to die, but one is better than five. I've really saved four lives. It seems like a very straightforward scenario. So now, here's another scenario. So now you're on a footbridge overlooking these trolley tracks. And you see another runaway trolley, and it's going to kill these same five workers on the trolley tracks. And, and it's terrible. These workers don't even know it's coming. You're going to watch this tragedy unfold. Then you look to your right, and you see a very large man leaning over the footbridge, staring at this too. And you suddenly realize that you could push this man onto the trolley tracks, and that he's so big that he would stop the trolley too. You have to indulge the hypothetical for just a couple seconds. So now, who would push this man onto the tracks? <laughs> so, so we have a couple of brave souls. Um, but, but not surprisingly, you see a complete reversal. So now 95% of people say, oh, God, that's 
I couldn't push a man onto the tracks. That's a horrible, repulsive thing to do. That's, you know, that's murder. I, I could never do that. And, and I think what this illustrates is even though the arithmetic is the same, even though someone like Kant would say, yeah, the numbers haven't changed. It's still one versus five. It's still better. Four, four more people still go home to their families because you were brave enough to push a man onto the tracks. It feels incredibly different. And it's that feeling that we can't really articulate why it feels so different. Nevertheless, that feeling drives our decision. So here's another example. This is from a psychologist at the University of Virginia named Jonathan Haidt. And he tells a story to his undergraduates. It's Jack and Jill, their brother and sister, they're vacationing in the south of France. And they're having a great time in France. And then one night they decide to have sex. Is it wrong? Do they commit a sin? So who, who says, yes, Jack and Jill did something wrong? You guys are very, uh, <laughs> very, very liberal audience. Um, <laughs> but but at, at least these undergraduates are convinced that what Jack and Jill was terribly wrong. And so then Jonathan says, well, why is it so wrong? Why is it so wrong to sleep with your sibling? And, this, and the first response of most students is to say, oh, because they may have a kid and their kid's going to have terrible genetic defects. And to which Jonathan says, well, don't worry, they use two forms of birth control. Is it still wrong? They say, oh, it's, oh God, of course, it's still wrong and disgusting. And he says, well, why? Well, it's going to ruin their sibling relationship. And he says, oh, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a fair point, but I actually brought them closer together. That, that, <laughs> that they had a great time, they're, they're not going to do it again, but, you know, it was just a great experience and, and now they're even closer. Is, this, is it still wrong to have sex with your sibling? And said, yes. And he goes on and on. He shoots down one reason after another until they reach what's called a state of moral confounding, which is they have no reasons left. All their conscious, rational reasons have been exhausted, and yet it still feels wrong. And it's that feeling that drives their moral behavior, that, that, that drives this, this decision to judge Jack and Jill. Now, now the reason I, I bring up these far-fetched moral examples is I think for a long time we've talked about morality in particular. Um, you know, forget serial shopping, but talk about morality in particular as, as justified by rationality. As justified by rationality. That's what Kant was up to with the categorical imperative. It's what we've been talking about ever since Moses came down with the Ten Commandments. That our morality wasn't just a set of feelings. It wasn't just wishy-washy instincts. It was actually grounded in necessity, in reason. And, and yet what you find when you look at these examples, be it trolleys, runaway trolleys, or or kind of gross examples of siblings doing stuff they probably shouldn't be doing, um, is, is that it's actually rooted in these emotions we can't really articulate. That, that you really see that so much of what we believe and so much of what we do is really driven by this subterranean unconscious, by this welter of feelings and instincts and emotions driving our decisions. But, but you've probably begun to think that I'm kind of setting up a straw man here, that I've been talking about emotions which have been hardwired into us. You know, we, we, we come with disgust instincts. Uh, you know, there are probably all sorts of good reasons why evolution has programmed us to find sibling sex repulsive. Um, and, and there are all sorts of evolutionary reasons why we should feel bad to push someone off a footbridge. That we are, after all, social primates, and so we've had to learn to get along. That's where so many of these moral instincts and feelings come from. But, but I think I'm not just talking about emotions that have been built into the brain over millions and millions of years. I think the emotions that really drive so many, of our everyday, so many of our everyday decisions are actually the byproduct of experience, of our own personal memories and experiences doing whatever it is we're doing. And, and the way I'd like to illustrate, I think, the power of these emotions that are generated by experience and expertise is to tell you a story. This story takes place on the second day of the ground invasion of the first Persian Gulf War. Excuse me. It involves Lieutenant Commander Michael Riley, who's uh, on board the HMS Gloucester. It's a British battleship. And his job that day is to protect the Allied convoy. It's a flotilla of 22 American battleships, destroyers, and two aircraft carriers, and in his job, these, this convoy has been brought in close to the Iraqi-Kuwaiti coast to provide ground cover for the ground troops, in particular the Marines going into Kuwait.